Hey, Happy Friday. This week, Rivian reinvented the e-bike. Samsung has a Vision Pro competitor that's surprisingly good, and it seems like nobody really wants to buy thin phones. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video is sponsored by IEEE Spectrum magazine. Okay, for my first story of the week, Rivian announced that they're making e-bikes now and that they've pretty radically rethought how bikes could work. There's a sort of regular e-bike called the TMB, a delivery quant thing called the TMQ, and also a new high-tech helmet with lights and speakers called the Alpha Wave, all under a slightly confusing new brand called Also. And I think the Also brand is a little bit too cheeky for my liking, kind of like nothing calling themselves nothing, but okay. Anyway, the biggest change from regular e-bikes is that Rivian uses a pedal-by-wire system. This means your pedals are not directly connected to the wheel at all. Instead, they power a generator, which then creates electricity. That electricity can then power a motor and also charge your battery. This means you can set how much resistance you want while biking and also do regenerative braking. So whether you want to work hard for a hill or make it a breeze is completely up to you. In a way, this is less like a bicycle and more like an electric motorbike at this point because the pedals are really just there to tell the computer on your e-bike how much power to give to the engine. Now, I've seen a few other e-bike brands do similar things before, like a company called Vok, which also makes cargo quad bikes, but it's the first time that I've seen a system like this in a regular bike. The battery on the bike is easily removable and can be charged with a USB-C, and the next innovation are these replaceable top frames, which supposedly allow your bike to convert from a cargo bike to a commuter or even a trail bike. Of course, you get a screen and all the smart stuff that you'd expect from a Rivian product, and the initial price tag is $4,500 starting in the US. International launches are not on the menu yet, but I found a comment on their YouTube channel where they said that a launch in Europe would potentially come in 2026. So as a fan of e-bikes, I really like new ideas and I really like that Rivian seems to have taken this very seriously, but that said, I do have four different concerns. First, there's the weight. We don't know the exact figures, but all that complex tech looks really heavy. Second, if your battery is dead, I guess the thing just doesn't work at all, or at least you'd have to pedal for a while to charge the battery. Third, converting your pedal power to electricity and then back into mechanical power again has to be way less efficient than just using a chain, so I guess you'd lose something like 20-30% of the power. And fourth, all of the parts of course are custom, so if anything breaks, you're 100% reliant on Rivian for a fix. That said, it looks like Rivian took the idea of reinventing the e-bike really seriously, and so I'd love to try one. Okay, for my second story of the week, Samsung launched the Galaxy XR headset, and uh, I think they did a much better job than I expected. Sure, we can make fun of this obviously being inspired by the Vision Pro, as it looks very similar physically and also does all of the same things. It can connect to your PC to create virtual monitors, it can turn your photos 3D, it can turn you into a 3D avatar for video calls, etc. But then I also think it might just be significantly better than the Vision Pro in many of the areas that actually matter. It straight up costs half as much at 1,800 bucks. It weighs 545 grams versus the at least 750 for the Vision Pro, making it much lighter. The headband that was inspired by the MetaQuest Pro is more comfortable without needing a top band that squishes your hair, and apparently you still get very similar quality displays and tracking as you do with Apple. There is no outer display so others can see your eyes, and it looks like the headset both has slightly lower quality pass-through cameras and also less performance, but it makes up for that with software that I think just makes a lot more sense. First, in terms of gaming, you have access to both 2D games from Steam and the Play Store and also Steam VR for a huge catalog of existing premium games on top of whatever else gets ported over to Android XR natively. But perhaps even more interesting is that Gemini allows you to just talk to your headset naturally. It can see what you see both inside the headset and in front of it and can react to it, it can open apps, it can search for things, arrange windows, it can do things like circle to search and more. I've never been a big fan of using AI to talk to my computer or my phone where I already have precise input methods like a keyboard and a mouse, but I think on a VR headset where you don't have all those things, I think this makes a lot of sense. Now, do people want headsets like this at all? Honestly, I think the answer overwhelmingly seems to be a no, but hey, at least this one looks like a pretty good version. I just can't get over how weird this promo image feels. Like, why is his hair so weird? Why does he twist his hat so far back? It's just somehow really unsettling to me. Anyway, and for my third story of the week, it looks like the wave of thin phones might already be dead. Nikkei reported that Apple has slashed iPhone Air production due to significantly worse than expected sales. This is unlike all the other iPhone 17 series models which have all outperformed and are all being ramped up. The iPhone Air apparently only accounted for roughly 10-15% to of overall new iPhone production this year, but even that was too much, so Apple is moving nearly to end of production levels. 
in other words, they appear to have way too much stock that they're starting to clear out. And of course, just like two weeks ago, we heard that the Galaxy S25 Edge was also selling terribly, that Samsung has killed the next version of that phone. So it really seems like this form factor might be pretty much dead in the water. Hey, Editing Martin here, and we got a report from Counterpoint after I finished recording that shows an even more brutal picture. This shows market share in the US and China for the launch period, and the Air only made up 3% of sales. Now, this is slightly misleading as the Chinese launch of the Air was a bit delayed, but still the Air is likely selling even less than the Mini before it, which, as you might remember, got killed. Oof. Okay, and for our release monitor, Anchor has officially released their new Prime chargers that they teased at IFA. And the most interesting ones from their lineup are likely a new super compact unit that can output a pretty bonkers 160 watts from three USB-C ports, while there's also a massive prime power bank, which is pretty hilarious. You can charge it with up to two USB-C ports simultaneously, allowing you to pump up to 250 watts into it, so you can charge its 26,000 milliamp hours up to 50% in just 15 minutes. That's crazy. And then significantly more chill is that Casio has released a new G-Shock version of their hilarious watch ring. It's called the G-Shock Nano WN5600. It comes in three colors and it has so far launched in Japan and a bunch of European countries. Product links as usual are in the description and now let's move on to the brief. In sad but extremely predictable news, you can now pay $60 for a mod and ship your Meta Ray-Bans to a dude who will disable the white recording LEDs on them so you can film stuff in secret. I hate this. And then also this week, Microsoft announced Miko, a bubbly animated head for Copilot that will apparently have way more personality with real talk and can apparently also morph into Clippy, while the company also added Copilot groups so you can invite friends to a chat and work on something like a project with them. In more AI news, OpenAI launched their very own brand browser called ChatGPT Atlas this week, which as you might imagine is based on Chromium and basically has ChatGPT built in on the sidebar. You can chat with it about stuff that you see on the website or also ask it to click around websites for you and for example buy some sunscreen on your behalf. Then, if you needed more proof that crime is legal as long as you're rich, Trump has pardoned the convicted founder of Binance. This is a guy that has already pleaded guilty to his company laundering billions of dollars, but Trump likes crypto now and so all is forgiven. Cool. Next, a French company called Visora has announced that they have successfully taped out their new chip, which is made specifically for AI inference in data centers. They claim that it is competitive on the high end in some tasks with 32,000 teraflops of performance, while also consuming 50% less power than current market leading chips, whatever that might mean, and the first unit should come out by early 2026. A tape out means that they're basically finished with the design and they're now moving on to manufacturing. That is apparently going to happen with TSMC's 5 nanometer process. So this is probably not the most high-end chip in the world. But yeah, this could or could not become Europe's first proper AI chip. Let's see. And in related news, NVIDIA and TSMC have produced the first Blackwell wafer made in the US, though the wafer, for now, still has to be shipped back to Taiwan to complete the final production. Still, that is a pretty major achievement. And then here's a new story from last week, which I forgot to report on earlier. The EU has now revised its USB-C charging laws with two updates. First, it will require that all USB-C chargers now come with detachable cables to save on waste if your cable breaks. And second, the chargers will also have to meet higher energy efficiency standards, all starting in 2028. Nice. Then in more governmental news, the Trump administration is in talks to take equity stakes in quantum computing firms. This is reportedly in exchange for federal funding like Trump has done with Intel. Sounds a whole lot like not the free market to me, but seems to be the direction everywhere in the world. And still in the quantum realm, Google this week claimed that their quantum computing chip Willow was able to run something called a quantum echo algorithm that solved the problem 13,000 times faster than regular supercomputers, which they call the first real demonstrable quantum advantage. Quantum computing is a little bit above my pay grade to explain, but I find this kind of engineering super fascinating. And if you do too, then I have a recommendation for you that I definitely think you did not see coming. A subscription to IEEE Spectrum. This is the flagship print magazine from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, which has stood for real expertise in their fields for more than 60 years. I have to admit that as someone who's permanently and hopelessly online, a print magazine didn't feel like an immediately obvious fit, but the more I found myself overwhelmed by the constant drumbeat of the sensationalist online news cycle, the more I came to enjoy the distraction-free experience of just reading a well-written article on paper. 
And IEEE Spectrum is full of fascinating articles from the bleeding edge of technology and engineering. Just as an example, I loved this article on rethinking 6G, which explains why after the rush for 4G and 5G mobile internet, the next generation doesn't seem to hold as much promise as imagined. Or also this one on graphene biosensor tattoos, which explains how nearly invisible structures can be used to detect various biomarkers, as well as why using those might or might not be a good idea. I actually find reading these articles really useful for finding inspiration for upcoming videos among other things, and if you're curious about the world and want to read it from a trusted source, I think you'll like it too. Meanwhile, a subscription is also a great gift idea, and the magazines look really great on a coffee table too. So join innovators and engineers from the likes of Apple, Samsung, MIT, and NASA in reading IEEE Spectrum, get a subscription using my link in the description or by scanning a QR code, that also lets them know that I sent you, which helps my channel. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you next Friday. Bye.